Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis with the Daily Beast. He's their senior columnist. Friend of mine and friend of America. All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Kunin. He's a physicist and leader in science policy in the United States. He served as Undersecretary for Science in the U.S. Department of Energy under President Obama, the second person ever to hold this role, where he was the lead author of the department's strategic plan and the inaugural Quadrennial Technology Review. He is currently a professor at New York University and the Stern School of Business, Tandon School of Engineering and Department of Physics, and he is founder Founding Director of NYU Center for Urban Science of Arts. Is that right? I got that wrong. Urban Science and Progress. And Progress. Urban Science and Progress. Yeah. More importantly, <laughs> for, for our purposes here, he is the author of a new book, Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us and What It Doesn't and Why It Matters. Dr. Stephen Coonan, welcome to the news. Good pleasure to be talking with you, Matt. Sorry for butchering that intro, but I think everyone got a lot of the important stuff, including let's start with the point that you worked for President Obama, and now you're writing a book called Unsettled, and uh, some people might find that unsettling. Right. Um, you know, I think the fundamental th point of the book is that the science that people keep invoking in political and popular discussions about climate um, is much distorted and discordant with what the scientific reports actually say. What I like to quip is to steal a line from the Princess Bride and say, the science doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, and in fact, you know, there are many things in the popular perception that are just not so. And they're not in the official reports at all, the consensus science, but somehow through media and other people distorting or corrupting the message have become common beliefs. For example, you know, there's no detectable trend in hurricanes over the last hundred years. Nevertheless, any time there's a big hurricane, the media say climate change. Similarly, there's no trend in heat waves in the U.S. over the last 60 years. And the current incidence of heat waves, how often they occur, is about the same as it was in 1900. Greenland isn't melting any faster today than it was 80 years ago. So there are lots of ups and downs in the climate. And we confuse weather with climate very often. Yeah, yeah, it, it's interesting, right? So like, let's take temperature, global warming. Temperature is the biggest thing. And now you correct me if I'm wrong, but here's my understanding, is that uh, the temperature increased by like a degree uh, the first part of the 20th century, then it actually decreased for a couple of decades. And now it is back up again. However, what we don't know is if this is anthropogenic, meaning if it is a result of humans, because there have been other times throughout history where it was hotter or colder. And so it's just not that clear. Right. And, you know, we are have been on a warming trend for the last 400 years as we came out of the Little Ice Age. So the depths were about 1600 or so. Uh, and in addition, the fact that, as you noted, it went down from about 1940 to 1970, the global temperature, even as greenhouse gases continued to accumulate, suggests that there are other forces at play. And a big challenge in climate science is disentangling the response to human influences from that natural variability. So I have a lot of questions and I'm sure our audience is, has a lot of questions they want me to ask. Um, but let's start with 
something interesting in your book that I that I found noteworthy is there's this thing called the American Physical Society, which is I think hundreds of physicists around the world, I think. And they had a public statement that was, I believe, to be a little bit misleading. And you were involved in recrafting that public statement. I would love to for you to tell us that story. Sure. So the American Physical Society is the professional society of physicists. It's got about 50,000 members around the world, mostly American, but many people from abroad as well. And in, I think, 2007, they put out a statement about climate science and climate change, uh, and it used the word incontrovertible. And for a physicist, that word is a red flag. It means it cannot be challenged. And there was a big brouhaha among the membership about that word. Eventually, in, I believe, 2009 or 2010, the society had to issue a multi-paragraph explanation of what it meant or thought it meant by the statement that it issued. In late 2013, the statement had reached its shelf life. It was time to refresh the statement. And I was asked by the society leadership to undertake an exercise to recommend a new statement. And I thought, you know, we're physicists. We can understand this stuff. And so rather than simply take the IPCC, the UN report, at face value, that we would do a deep dive. And so I convened a one-day meeting in January of 2014 in Brooklyn with three people, three scientists, deep experts representing the consensus, and three people who were also deep experts who did not quite agree with the consensus. And we sat and talked for a day. There were presentations. The whole thing was transcribed, uh, and you can read it on the web. And I came away from that meeting feeling that the science was far less settled than I had been led to believe while I was working for uh, the Obama administration. And so I started to pay close attention to what was going on. I wound up writing a big piece in the Wall Street Journal that September, about nine months later, pointing out some of the problems. Uh, I got a lot of comments, about more than 2,000 online comments. Uh, most of them supportive, but some people saying, how could you give ammunition to the deniers? Or saying, it's okay to raise those issues, but why don't you do it in a less public forum? And I then started to pay really close attention, not only to the science, but how it was presented to the public. And as now, six or seven years later, uh, I came to write this book because I believe that the public should have an accurate presentation of what we know and what we don't know as it decides what to do about growing human influences on the climate. You talk about, in the book, you talk about this game of of telephone, right? And everybody, all kids play this game where you, you whisper a secret in someone's ear and they whisper it. And at the end of the line, it's a different story. And I'm sure that does happen to a certain degree, right? Scientists write like official reports and those reports become bastardized and simplified and by the then journalists interpret it. So that's probably, I'm sure that's part of the story, but it can't be the whole thing. I mean, people like President Obama and President Biden will use, quote, the science as intro incontrovertible proof uh, that we have to do something pretty radical that could dramatically impact our economy. It could put who knows how many people out of work. Um, you had the ear to a certain degree of, of politicians. Why don't they tell the truth? I, you know, I, there are probably several reasons for that. Uh, one is, you know, with all due respect to President Obama, President Biden, um, they probably don't have the time and I doubt that they have the expertise to dip deeply into the science. And so other people do. Um, you know, my good friend and colleague, or maybe former friend now, Ernie Moniz, who was under secretary, I'm uh, sorry, was secretary of energy <laughs> for uh, uh, one term in the second Obama administration. I mean, those folks do have the capacity to look at the science. 
Uh, Bill Gates is another person who you would think would have looked more deeply. And when you do, you realize that talking about a climate crisis or climate disaster or climate emergency is really overblown and is over-egging the custard. Uh, on the other hand, there are scientists who have hitched their reputation to a uh, climate disaster or at least a serious climate problem. Uh, it means money. It means fame. Um, there's a lot of pressure to go along with the consensus as it's been illuminated. And I think there are therefore multiple reasons why the politicians are not telling the truth. You know, there's a, a wonderful quote that I cite You're in not the book. Sorry, from H.L. Mencken. Uh, who's, uh, no, no, you go uh, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, who, who says, you know, the purpose of practical politics is to keep the public alarmed by a series of uh, imaginary threats, most of them, uh, most of them imaginary. Uh, and so politicians, you can't blame them. Their purpose is to inspire, to stimulate action. And OK, we kind of accept that they don't always tell the truth. But it's the scientists and the scientists who are informing the politicians where I would find fault. Yeah. Now, I this this is maybe beyond the scope of the book, but I will just say, I think there are children out there who are scared, very scared, because they believe, because adults tell them, experts tell them, they think that it's all over, and yeah, that's got to have some psychological toll that is problematic. Yeah, I would say, you know, there are several reasons why it's really bad to misrepresent the science. And, you know, a lot of the book is not only about what the science really says, but how it got misrepresented. And one of the most extreme consequences, and I think it's almost immoral to do this, is to scare the bejesus out of young people that the world is going to end in 12 years or that uh, there's no future and therefore you shouldn't be having children. I mean, that's terrible. Okay? There are other things that are bad about misrepresenting the science. Maybe most importantly is that it robs from decision makers who are not experts and the general public the right to make fully informed decisions. In the end, the decisions about what we do about human influences on the climate are, are really a values discussion. Our policies express values and priorities. They have to be informed by the science, but they have to balance risk, intergenerational equity, development versus the environment, all of those things. Those are in science. But the scientists should be painting an accurate picture, and that has not been happening. Um, I know you worked, you were young, uh, and and you worked with Richard Feynman, who I I read his book a while ago. I mean, he's probably written a lot of books, but I read his very popular like memoir a few years ago, which was awesome. And it talks about I guess he was like a young man working like on the Manhattan Project or somehow uh, adjacent to that. And then later on, he like headed the um, uh, trying to figure out what happened with the Challenger disaster. Um, and he also like played the bongos, <laughs> and, uh, quite an interesting character. I'd love to hear you talk about him and also like what you learned from him that has um, in influenced your uh, worldview on this. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I never actually did any research with Dick. I learned a lot from him. Um, he was one of the most brilliant physicists of the 20th century, but also, as you say, quite a character. And <laughs> I, he was he was a member of the Challenger Commission, but was not the chair. That was Rogers. OK, so you see, not only are you fact checking the science, you're fact checking the interview. And I love it. Well, Thank you. you know, Keep I, it I, up. I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I lived through that as an adult. I don't know exactly how old you are, but I suspect <laughs> that you might not have been paying attention back in the. Great Didn't he, OK, but oh. I seem to recall him like going in front of the cameras and he, I don't know if he had like a, some sort of a leadership role. Or... No, no, but in a very vivid public demonstration of what the problem was at one of the meetings, public meetings, it was on TV, of the commission, he took a piece of an O-ring from the shuttle booster 
and dipped it in some ice water and demonstrated that it got brittle when it was cold. And that was very characteristic of wow. Feynman, very simple but direct and very accessible demonstration of science. I think the thing I learned most from Feynman, but also from a number of other mentors later on, is that when you're informing policy as a scientist, you tell the truth, the whole truth. And you let the decision maker in the end make the difficult calls. It's not up to you as a scientist to determine which way the decision should go, much less, you know, shade the information you give in order to make it go one way or the other. Uh, the, I quote in the book a wonderful passage from a speech Feynman gave at the 1974 Caltech commencement. And I, I won't get it exactly right, but basically says, you know, I was listening last night to an advertisement about Wesson oil. And the advertisement said, Wesson oil won't soak through food. And he says, what they didn't tell you is that all oils won't soak through food. But if you get them all at a high enough <laughs> temperature, they all will soak through food. And so it's this issue of misleading by not providing proper context or full information that I think scientists yeah. should be avoiding, partic uh, particularly in this context where it's so complicated and there are so many different dimensions to our understanding. Give me some examples or an example of where um, there's a data point or a statistic or something where if I heard it, I would be convinced that climate change is going to kill us all tomorrow. And then if you provide a little context, it falls apart. Yeah. So let's talk about sea level. OK, sea level rise. Over the last three decades, sea level has been rising at the grand rate of three millimeters a year. And if you're not familiar with the metric system and can't quite do the multiplications fast enough in your head, I will tell you that that's one foot a century. And that's higher than the average rate that we saw over the 20th century. But they don't tell you several important things. Is that if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, when human influences were much smaller, it was rising at almost the same rate. And then in the 1970s, it went down to about one millimeter a year, a third of what it is currently, and now it's going back up again. And so it fluctuates up and down. And by emphasizing just what happened in the last three decades and ignoring comparable behavior in the past century, uh, they're misleading. They're also misleading when they don't tell you that sea level has been rising for the last almost 20,000 years. As the last glaciers started to melt, the seas have started to go up. And it was going up really fast until about 7,000 years ago. And then it's become more gradual. And the current rate is what I told you it is. So without providing that kind of context. Must have been. Sorry, go ahead. Must have been all that coal we were burning 7,000 years ago, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, and all the, the cars 7,000 years ago. The SUVs <laughs> in uh, uh, whatever. Uh, no, so the climate <laughs> varies naturally. And as I said, the challenge is to disentangle what's human caused and what's natural. But if you're just talking about the data, not considering the whole data set providing context uh, is, in my view, a sin. So, you know, I'm going to ask you to do something scientists probably don't like to do, which is, um, you know, like, well, I guess you guys hypothesize, right? Um, is your sense that some of this is cyclical, some of this probably is man-made, but it's not the end of the world? And if we, you know, we're already doing better in terms of emissions, we don't have to do something radical that's going to wreck our economy, uh, but innovations are actually going to help, and maybe it's not the end of the world as we know it. No, it's certainly not the end of the world. Is that kind of where, where you come down? Yeah, I, and, and the reports say that, and I'll give you one example in a moment. Um, but, um, you know, what fraction of the recent warming is man-made and what fraction is natural is still up for grabs. A lot of that understanding depends upon the models and the big computer models, which we can have a discussion about, have actually gotten less certain as they become more sophisticated. 
So the modeling is in a, I would say, a rather sorry state, and everybody wishes it would be better than it is, but it's very difficult. Let me give you a, a, a factoid about the end of the world discussion. When you read either the U.S. or U.N. reports, and read them carefully, what they say is that a warming of, let's say, 5 degrees centigrade, which would be 9 degrees Fahrenheit, by the end of this century, would have about a 5 or 6% impact on the economy, whether it's for the globe or for the U.S. Now, that sounds like a lot, right? 5 or 6%. But what they forget to tell you is that the economies will be growing tremendously between now and the end of the century. To put some numbers on it, uh, if the economy in the U.S. were to grow from today's $20 trillion at 2% for the next 70 years, it would be $80 trillion at the end of 70 years, uh, four times what it is today. And that's not out of line with historical growth rates. What the reports say is that the climate impact on that growth would mean that instead of 80 trillion at the end of the century, it would be 76 trillion at the end of the century. And nobody can project with that kind of accuracy. And in fact, the reports say that climate is only one relatively minor factor in determining economic well-being. Our policies, technology, trade are much more important. So at least as far as the economy goes, this is by no means the end of the world. Yet, nevertheless, the papers, the newspapers, the media misrepresent the reports by saying that it is. Um, I'm curious about the the plans that say, like President Biden, for example, has proposed, um, or just generally environmentalist plans. Like, obviously, they could have detrimental impacts on the economy and things like that. Maybe even geopolitically, our ability to compete. China or whatever. But in terms of actually the environment, could they be counterproductive? Is there are, is there anything that you're seeing that alarms you in terms of a so-called fix or solution? Well, you know, the, the plans that the Biden administration has proposed would amount to a very disruptive restructuring of our energy system and society more broadly if we're to achieve the emission goals that they've outlined for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, society might well decide it wants to reduce emissions, but first of all, the rest of the world has got to come along, and that's not at all obvious. Uh, and then secondly, we need to do it in a more gradual and thoughtful way, maintaining the reliability and economic, low economic cost of the energy that it provides. Uh, I like to say we need to change the energy system by orthodonture rather than tooth extraction. So let's do it slowly, thoughtfully, rather than this really sudden disruption uh, that would ensue if we were to meet those goals. By the way, I have the opinion that we will not be able to meet those goals uh, but in fact, it's the purpose of politicians to set goals that are often never. <laughs> and I can give you many examples in energy where that is the case. Well, give me one. Well, you know, um, so ethanol. Uh, ethanol is a partial substitute for gasoline. Uh, we produce ethanol out of corn right now, and we produce about 15 billion gallons a year, about 10% of the gasoline that we consume. And I think almost everywhere now, uh, it, gasoline that you get at the pump or fuel you get at the pump is about 10% ethanol. There are better ways in principle to produce ethanol. Uh, one of them is cellulosic ethanol, which means not using the food from crops, but to use the structural material of the plants, the cellulose. It's, however, a much more difficult chemical process to produce that cellulose. And now, more than a decade ago, Congress set a goal of having so many billions of gallons of cellulosic ethanol in the uh, gasoline pool every year, growing amounts. And, of course, we've never hit that goal. 
we're now far below it. I don't know exactly the numbers, but, you know, it's now been 15 years after the fact. And we're still below it. And Congress just keeps changing, you know, forgiving or giving a, a, a waiver every year. So that's one example of, of you know, the legislators. Is ethanol actually government. better? You know. um, well, you know. Is ethanol in, in actually ways, better for the environment? Um, the way we produce it, no. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions from corn ethanol in the U.S. are just about the same as what they are from gasoline derived from crude oil. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to Brazil, where they make a lot of ethanol, most of the country runs on ethanol, uh, it's much more um, forgiving. Well, it's, it emits far less carbon dioxide. Uh, and that's because sugar cane uh, goes there and is a much better material for making ethanol than corn is. So like I had a, I had a guest um, as the author of that book called The Prize. Um, and he was on the podcast and he told me that China keeps bragging about all their electric cars, but they're using coal to generate the electricity. So it actually is horrible for the environment. It's actually worse than running the cars on gasoline. <laughs> right. Uh, and in, terms of, in, in terms of CO2, uh, if the coal plants were clean, as they are relatively here in the U.S., but not in China, then it, running the cars on electricity would reduce the local pollution. So in a city, you wouldn't necessarily get the kind of smog that you would uh, if they were all running on uh, gasoline without catalytic converters. Um, but yes, the greenhouse gas emissions from electric cars depend an awful lot on how you get the electricity. Of course, the vision here in the U.S. for some people is that we will go to all electric cars and that electricity will come from emission-free sources, mostly wind and solar. Well, that's going to mean we're going to need more electricity probably about 30% more electricity than we're producing currently. And it's got to be wind and solar, as well as the rest of the energy production is supposed to be wind and solar. And I think that's just, you know, uh, you know, as a scientist and somebody who um, knows a bit about the energy system, my question is, how are you going to do that? And nobody has really outlined the plans to make that happen uh, with the economy and reliability that we currently have for gasoline power cars. But I, you know, and I forget, but just Biden just unveiled this plan and I forget what percentage of our energy is supposed to be from renewables, but it's a pretty high percent in the future. Like, so with it with seems unrealistic to, to me. Now, with respect to the electricity system, the announced goal is to have zero emissions from electricity production by 2035. It's a little bit different than the 50% reduction in emissions overall by 2030, but the electricity system is supposed to go emission-free in 14 years. And right now, the only emission-free sources of electricity we have are, first of all, let's start, uh, hydropower provides about 6%, I think, of U.S. electricity right now, uh, but we've built all the big dams we're going to build. Uh, nuclear power provides 19% of U.S. electricity right now. It is the biggest emissions free source that we have, uh, but we haven't built a nuclear plant in this country in a couple of decades for the various reasons we can get into. Um, there's wind and solar, and wind is growing. Solar is growing also uh, in terms of the amount of electricity, but they take land they're intermittent, and so you have to learn how to manage the grid when wind or solar is not generating. And there are issues with stability of the grid uh, if we get too high a fraction of wind and solar. And beyond that, well, you can think about capturing the carbon from gas or coal plants, but that's pretty expensive. And, and so, you know, I look at this and I ask, how are we going to do that, particularly given the pace of uh, – new installations that we've historically had for electricity. Uh, I think it's a very heavy lift. Yeah. Uh, so let me, me ask you this. You now, I know me, throughout... Okay. I was just going to say, if you told me we were going to do it by 2050, 40 year, or 30 years from now, or 40 years from now, I think that starts to sound much more doable. Yeah. 
Um, so I know throughout your career, you've been in, you know, even when you were a scientist, you were not always looking close. You were not necessarily focused on the climate, right? But I'm wondering if, do you have a sense for how we got where we are in terms of the um, alarmism? Like, I guess this starts in the 60s or 70s, but like the evolution of how we got to where we are kind of from a political standpoint. Yeah. Um, So, you know, if you, well, first of all, I should say, that the fear of a changing climate and the ability of man's actions to influence the changes in climate is a notion as old as the Bible. If you go back and read in the Bible, there's a, a line that says basically the God is talking and he says, if you obey what I'm telling you, then you'll get seven good years of rain or something like that. Um, so, um, you know, people have this innate sense that if we do something, we might be able to influence what's going on. Back in the 60s and early 70s, the scientific consensus was that the globe was cooling. And uh, some of the scientists today will say, no, no, that's not true. But you have leaders of various scientific organizations uh, making speeches saying we've got to be worried about the cooling of the globe, largely due to the aerosols that um, we were producing. And then I think as you go through the uh, 80s and 90s, people had a sense that growing carbon dioxide uh, would exert a warming influence on the planet. In fact, the notion was known back to the 1850s, but not really had much prominence. And Then, um, you know, we started to learn more about the ice cores and we started to have better models. And I think there was starting to be a growing sense that uh, humans were influencing the climate. Um, A key uh, development was at some point, and I don't, unfortunately, I'm blanking on exactly when, uh, Dave Keeling, who was a geochemist working at Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, started to measure the global concentration of carbon dioxide with good precision. This was probably back in the early 70s, I guess. And he discovered that from one year to the next or the next couple, it was going up a little bit. And more years of measurement, and you realize that you could tie that in many ways to the burning of fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so people started to become worried that, well, the CO2 is going up, and maybe that's exerting a warming influence on the climate. I think the notion was popularized by Al Gore um, and Inconvenient Truth, the movie, and God knows how many presentations and so on. Um, And that started to um, get it into the popular perception. Uh, And then we can go from there. I mean, you probably know the recent political history as well as I. Um, And to the point now where, of course, the Biden administration has decided to infuse climate in everything the federal government is doing. Uh, And I think that's not very good at all. Um, The the country has got many problems. The world has got problems. Climate, if it is a problem, human influences on the climate, if it is a problem, is a longer term uh, and, again, economically likely a very minor effect on the well-being of the world. And, you know, this is Steve talking. All right. So um, I'm I'm, I'm just going to say this is not me talking, but it's simply me uh, repeating uh, what's in the official assessment report. So I think the way I want to end is by asking you two questions that are pretty simplistic. And you may end up repeating some of the things you've said before. You may not. But I think... uh, that it would be helpful for us. Um, the first would be if if you were just talking to me, okay, I'm a center right guy. Um, I, you know, but I don't have like a radical anti-environmentalist agenda. Like I want to be right. I want to, I don't want to look stupid years from now. Um, you know, you and I are having a cup of coffee and I ask you, like, level with me, 
what's the deal? What do I need to know? And, uh, you know, what's the deal? What do you say? So what, what I would say is that, you know, Matt, things are nowhere near as certain scientifically as you might be led to believe. And I would go through some of the observational points we've talked about. Um, and I would say, Matt, what you should think about society's actions uh, is really a complicated issue. It's got risks involved. Uh, it's got the need to balance providing energy to the 40% of the world that doesn't have adequate energy right now. Um, and so, Matt, take the time to really understand what the science says. You could read what I wrote in the book. You can dig more deeply into the reports. Ask questions and then impose your own values on uh, what you think we should be doing. I, I know that's really not an answer, uh, but that values question is not something I feel like I should be giving you my answer to, because in fact, we all will have different answers about what we think we should be doing. And let me tell you, if you were talking to somebody who is in one of the undeveloped parts of the world uh, that doesn't have adequate energy, they would have a very different uh, set of values uh, than you and I would sitting here uh, in comfortable developed world situations. Absolutely. And um, I would say, uh, before I ask the last question, which is a little bit similar, but let me give a another plug for the book, Unsettled, because, you know, when you're having a conversation with somebody, you know, unless you're a total geek and in a very annoying person, you're going to talk conversationally and a little bit anecdotally. The book, though, is very well suited to be fully documented and, and citations and quotes. So it's going to give you all the details um, at your fingertips. And that'll make you, uh, I think, a better you know, citizen. And also, if you want to argue about this, you'll have the facts <laughs> at your disposal. My last question is similar. But let's say you've been called in to talk to President Biden. But you know how that goes. You're going to be interrupted in five minutes. So what is like the one thing you want him to know? Um, President Biden, um, please do not represent the science as settled. That is a misrepresentation. These are complicated issues. As a politician, you are perfectly in your lane to be talking about values and priorities. That's what we look to politicians to do. But please do not misrepresent the science. It's very damaging both to public confidence in science as well as uh, eroding the quality of the decisions that society has to make. Good. And, and you know, you, you touch on an interesting point there, right? Like if they say... In 10 years, Manhattan's going to be underwater and it doesn't happen. Then, you know, it's like the boy who cried wolf eventually. And like, what else? What else are we not going to believe? You That's know, right. fake news, right? That's right. So let's have a transparent, complete exposition of the science. And I would say that just about the book, you know, as a scientist, I'm trained to focus on facts and, you know, comprehensive facts, not anecdotes. There's an old saying that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. And um, we, we try to stick with the data. And it's there in the book. It's called Unsettled. <clears throat> Unsettled, what climate science tells us, what it doesn't, and why it matters. Stephen Coonan, thank you for coming on the news. Pleasure to be talking with you. If you like this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matt K. Lewis.
Thank you for listening to Matt Lewis and the News.